So, hello, and welcome to another webinar with Natural Products Canada. I'm Sue Quillen. Today, we are very pleased to concentrate on financial decisions that can help your business grow. And I have with me Michael Blanc, Patrick Carruthers, and Sean Stager from Grant Thornton. And for those of you that might not be familiar with Grant Thornton, they provide assurance, tax, and business advisory service in more than 130 countries worldwide. So they've kind of seen it all. Here in Canada, Patrick, Sean, and Mike are part of a Grant Thornton team that specializes in technology-based businesses, which, as we know, includes innovative natural products and bioproducts. Um, by the way, this is the first of three presentations we'll be hosting with Grant Thornton this fall. So if you find this one helpful, you may want to sign up for their next one, which is October 16th, uh, focused on funding, financing, and government incentives. Today, as usual, we'll open this up for questions at the end, uh, but we'll also let you ask questions after each section of the presentation. So just use the chat feature so we can see if you'd like to ask a question. And as a reminder, we're recording the webinar, so you'll have access to the slides and the audio online within a couple of days. So we've got a lot to cover, so I think I'll just hand it right over to Mike to get started. Thanks, Sue. And thanks everybody for joining us with our Startup Readiness Program. As Sue mentioned today, we're focusing on making good financial decisions. Uh, just as a quick intro, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Mike LeBlanc. I fall under Assurance Services. I focus on our private enterprise group, and I'll be focusing on financial reporting, financial best practices, and cloud accounting. And I have two other individuals on the team that will quickly introduce themselves. Thanks, Mike. I'm Patrick Carruthers. I'm uh, here in Halifax and Grand Thornton's domestic tax team. And today I'm going to be talking about tax planning, tax structures, personal cash flow, business scalability. I'm just going to jump in and just say uh, it was really hard to hear you, Patrick. So it, when it comes to Patrick's turn, you might need to be a little closer to the mic. Thanks, right, Sue. Thanks. And uh, I'm Sean Stager. I work in uh, Grand Thornton's advisory group. So... As a group, we specialize in valuation, M&A, due diligence, and financial modeling. Uh, the focus of kind of my discussion today is going to be on financial projections and business planning. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So starting with assurance, we're going to begin with what is actually assurance? Well, businesses use assurance services to increase the transparency, relevance, and value of information that they disclose to the market, their investors, and all their users of the financial statements. There are three type of core financial statements that are produced by CPAs. They are compilations or notice to readers, reviews, and audit engagements. So to start, I'm just going to go through each three of them and kind of what they comprise and how we get there, and then we'll learn into uh, more of the developing to get there. So notice to readers and compilation statements. These statements typically configure of a balance sheet and an income statement. There's no assurance given. Although the financial statements are prepared by CPAs, there's no such things as audit or reviewing for accuracy or completeness. This means there's typically very little procedures that goes into validating the information provided by the client. In my personal practice with Grant Thornton, we do go a little bit further in assessing the validity of the bank receivables and such things as comparatives because we typically do use these statements to drive the tax returns. It's also important to know that these are not necessarily in accordance with accounting frameworks. As we look at reviews and audits, they follow a specific accounting standards for private enterprises or public enterprises that really gives a framework of the type of accounting that needs to be done, where a notice reader or compilation, not necessarily do we need to follow those types of standards. It's also important to note that this may not be an acceptable level of assurance. As we've noted, there's really no assurance or opinion given on the statements, it's truly just a compilation of the information. So depending on the lenders and the investors and the financial situation of the companies, they may not be an acceptable level, but again, it's really based on the individual situation. Of the three statements that we're going to explore today, NTRs require the least amount of work, the least amount of effort, and typically are the least expensive for the client. And they still can be used to drive a lot of value for both business operations, tax returns, and business planning. Our next set of statements are review engagements. They offer a limited level of assurance, or in our world what we call negative assurance. We give a plausibility, a reasonableness to the amount, to the numbers that are presented. Typically, the CPA would perform a broad amount of review procedures, and a lot of this is analytically driven. Typically, we look at two, three, five years of data, 
compare them and try to build a true, real picture of what the company's been doing and how they've got there. And then really leverage that information and those discussions to get some more value-added discussions, and more tax planning and business planning. It's important to notice that you're responsible to provide the CPA with accurate information. Therefore, they're not liable for misstatements. As we've mentioned, a lot of this information is presented to potential investors, banks, provincial organizations, and anybody that's really interested in the company. So there is a level of accuracy that must happen. Let me tell you, I'm 100% honest with you. All the reviews that we see come through, they're never 100% perfect. We work with the management team to get that to that accuracy. Typically what happens is we'll evaluate the information and should provide suggestions on adjustments that need to be made to get them to that level. And then they're made and we work as a team to get that information to the banks. Again, we see these types of engagements required by many lenders, be it banks, angels, venture capitalists, regional investment agencies, or larger government agencies. They're kind of the middle between the, the NTR and the audit statements as they require a moderate amount of effort on both sides of the client and the CPA. And when that type of effort is needed, there's also a little bit of cost that comes with that. Looking at our highest level of assurance, we have an audit at level assurance engagements. Typically the auditor performs a lot of testing and evaluation of internal controls. Testing includes like vouching and tracing of actual invoices to transactions. It really dives into the day-to-day -day and they take a sample of information and really need to prove the quality and the accuracy of that information. At the end of the procedures, the auditor is able to give an opinion. This opinion is based on the financial information that they're presenting to the investors. Typical opinions would include a qualified opinion, an unbiased opinion, a departure from framework. Really, it depends on the accuracy. Much like a review, the CPA wants to work with the team to make sure that the information provided is at that level. Just because it's not there doesn't mean it won't get there. There is work that can happen between there. Um, typically, we see these types of engagements required around very large financing agreements, shareholder agreements, specific lenders. Again, when we look at these three types of financial statements and how they work for your business, it really depends on your specific situation and what the lenders and the users really want from that. And just to end it, this does take a greater deal of effort to complete these, as you can ex expect with the improved and inclusive testing. With this, it tends to be a lot more expensive. Now that we've looked at the three kind of core types of financial statements that CPA firms will produce, we're going to look at what it takes to be able to get to that point to be able to produce those statements. So depending on where your business might be, there may be some historic catch-up that needs to happen, or we just catch-up. When I refer, refer to current catch-up, I'm talking about doing monthly reconciliations, making sure that your information is caught up to date, both what's in your bank, with your receivables, and your cash, and your sales. The next part is looking at leveraging software to make this a much more automated and time-sensitive engagement. Right now, there's a lot of cloud-based cloud accounting solutions that are industry-driven to make this a much more smoother process. And finally, the internal controls. Internal controls are extremely important to implement in your business from the very start to ensure that things grow properly and that there's the right controls in place. So first, I'm just going to dive into the internal controls part of a private enterprise, and then we'll look at the leveraging of the cloud. So right here, we have the process of internal controls. We have, in control, we have the control environment, which we really need to understand, and then do a risk assessment. The risk assessment is taking a look at the various processes within the business and where true risk lies. After that's identified, we need to identify control activities. So these are activities or procedures that will mitigate the risk. And then finally, we want to continually be monitoring these processes and communicating them across all service lines and all parts of the business so that everybody's on the same line. So to give you kind of an example of some of these internal controls that we're referring to, one would be like the segregation of duties. I realize that a lot of startups and companies at the very beginning, the owner is typically wearing a lot of hats. You're the CFO, you're the sales, you're the CTO, you're the CEO. But as you do scale and you grow, segregation of duties becomes very important for mitigating fraud. So a great example in a small business where fraud could be is in the bank. We don't want the same person to be doing the bank run, check, cashing the checks, writing the checks, approving the checks, performing the bank reconciliations, because really there's an intrinsic risk for fraud. Having a step-to-step -step approval process 
having someone else prepare the bank reconciliations for who cashes the checks. They're all simple processes that can be put in place to help mitigate this risk. The next thing we have is access to controls. Who has access to softwares? What does the user's name and passwords look like? The next, physical audits. Do you have inventory? Do you have capital assets? Either weekly or monthly, you should be determining what is actually in your storefront versus what is your books, and that will help determine are things being sold, being stolen, really just gives you a better control. Next part is standardize of documentation. I'm gonna kinda of leave this because we're gonna dive into the cloud piece and how this can be a solution, but really, it's gonna save you a lot of time when it comes to CRA audits or dealing with any financial institution if you have everything in line and your documents in one area. The next part is periodic reconciliations. As I mentioned, a big part of this that we suggest is doing monthly reconciliations. That's looking at your bank reports, that's looking at your accounts receivable, your payables, credit cards, and making sure that they're actually reconciled on a periodic basis. And the last piece is the approval to authority. So who does check? Who does sign off on the checks? Who does have that signing authority for the various parts of the business? So seeing that, we kind of looked at our clients and tried to determine what are the true kind of bookkeeping, bookkeeping and accounting pains that private enterprises are dealing with right now. A big part is that the legacy accounting is time consuming. Taking bank statement information into Excel and into softwares can take hours and hours of time and really devalue the operator of the business from really putting that time in that grows the business. And for other examples, billable time and time with family is other areas that we can really take time from the back end and spend it there. Other big pain points that we see is clients being very unorganized, losing receipts, desk piled in paper, really no ways of managing this and ensuring that it is in place and is done correctly. These two items typically lead to behind and late filing penalties. We see lots of, lots of clients come in with historical information that's incorrect and have late filing penalties and, and major issues. A lot of this can also lead to unable to get financing. At the end of the day, having inaccurate data leads to inaccurate decisions. Having the quality of the information in the system and preparing those reconciliations is going to save you a lot of cost at the end of the year when having to go back through all of this. So how can we leverage a cloud-based solution to make this a lot more streamlined and a lot more better for the business? So there's three core areas. One is to streamline and organize your data and processes, looking at accounting, payroll, payments, and document management. Doing this, it'll allow you to gain a more clear and accurate view of your business performance anywhere, anytime. The cloud-based solution allows you to access your information by browser, by phone, no matter where you are in the world or any time of the day. All of this allows you to get closer to your business goals with a personalized service, giving you insights and advice, and allowing you to connect with experienced business advisors across the firm. So what does this look like for a private enterprise? This may look like a pretty basic drawing, but this is a tech stack that would be typical of a private enterprise. We have our QuickBooks on our right-hand side. This could be FreshBooks, this could be Zero, this could be Sage. Essentially, this is the brains of your accounting software. It works with the various applications around regarding payroll, standardized documentation, and payments to work as a, a true integration. So how has cloud-based solutions kind of come above the desktop versions? They have automatic bank feeds and credit card feeds. This means that all your information is being compiled in one spot. There's no more having to download bank statements, take that and translate it into Excel or any of that. It's all streamlined in the software itself and it's really a one-step approval. It's things like bank rules are set, so say you get gas at SO every week, it can recognize that that transaction is actually a gas transaction or gas to an automobile and it will be a one-step approval to get that account for. When we look at payroll, we look at wage point. This is an automated source deduction, CRA, T4, ROE. It does everything for you without having to do anything. And it's a really cost efficient way to do this. Hubdoc and Receipt Bank, this is an OCR technology. And when we're talking about standardization and documentation, this is a true key for that. So if I take a picture of an invoice or I took a picture of a receipt right now, it's able to pull off the last four digits of the number, the card, to know if it's a business visa, business bank card, personal visa. It also can pull the date, the time, the amount, and the vendor. 
it also ties that picture of the receipt to the transaction, which we call audit proofing. So when we go look at back at that transaction, we're actually able to pull the, the source document or the invoice related to that. While it's doing that, it's also creating an online storage cabinet for all your invoices, bills, and anything related to that. The final piece is Pluto. I'm not going to dive too deep into that, but it's really just an alternative to doing bank wires and ETFs. It's a little bit cheaper and it's a better solution than just going straight through the bank. The last part that I'd like to touch on this is just the mobile capability of this cloud-based software. You're able to access any type of statements anywhere you are by phone. You'll see on the right-hand side we have a screenshot of what it looks like from the mobile app. It's able to look at, okay, profit and loss. If your customer owes you something, what's the bank balance? And again, it allows you to compare budget to actuals in real time. I'm a firm believer by that integrating internal controls, leveraging software, and really growing the business is a key part to getting everything together when you look for financing, leveraging, tax planning, and projections. I'm going to take any quick questions on the assurance or the financial side before we move on to our tax. All right, thanks, Pat. All right, thanks, Michael. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So I'm going to get to talking about the tax piece. So what's up? Sorry, sorry, I had to take myself off mute. I'm not hearing you very well, um, not nearly as well as I was hearing Mike. Is, that, is this better? A little bit. Okay, perfect. So what tax topics will be covered today? Tax planning. So why is it important from the start? We're going to talk about creating a tax efficient career. You know what? Sorry, I'm just. It, it's really not great. Um, it, it, is there any way that you can move a little bit so that you're kind of closer to to um, the mic where Mike where Mike was? Is that better? Way better. Yes. Thank okay. You. It was on his computer. <laughs> oh, okay. That's much much better. Thank you so much. All right, today, so what tax topics will we cover today? So tax planning, so why is it important from the start? Uh, we're gonna talk about creating a tax efficient career, and then we're gonna get into tax structures, uh, sole proprietorship, partnerships, incorporation, and then we're gonna get into personal cash flow with uh, corporate remuneration options, and we're gonna then talk about maintaining business saleability, so the qualified small business corporation piece. All right, so continuing on. So why is tax planning important? So tax represents the largest single expense in your business life. So current combined rates of tax on various sources of income, uh, for employment and business income, it's up to 54% personally, investment or other income up to 54%. So this is a Nova Scotia rate, which most Atlantic provinces will be close to. Uh, Ontario and BC tend to have lower rates at that, at that high marginal tax rate. Uh, dividends uh, up to 41.5% for eligible dividends and 47% for non-eligible dividends. So the difference between eligible and non-eligible dividends on a simple basis is that if you're in a corporation and you're earning in excess of $500,000 of active business income, that pool above $500,000 of income creates this eligible income pool. So effectively it just creates a, an integrated tax rate once that $1 arrives down that individual's pocket. So as you can see, efficient tax planning is important uh, in order to build long-term wealth. So creating a tax efficient career. So as you may or may not know, employees are limited in tax planning strategies. Uh, employees are just issued a T4 slip. They have minimal ability to deduct employment expenses unless their employer allows them to and kind of signs off on a form that they should file with the CRA at when they file their personal tax returns. But uh, self-employed individuals they do have greater flexibility as they are allowed to deduct employment or deduct business expenses against whatever kind of business income they create um, but incorporated businesses so that's businesses that are incorporated in a corporation they have the best flexibility in most planning opportunities in compares in comparison to self-employed individuals so why, why I'm saying that is there's a lower rate on tax rate on business income so you're taxed at 13% uh, in corporately on active income in Nova Scotia for income under $500,000 versus 54% for any income if you're an individual who makes over $202,000. So that spread is substantial and allows you to kind of defer uh, some income in a corporation if you can. Uh, there's an ability to access different forms of remuneration. So 
uh, you're able to pay salaries versus dividends, uh, and it creates an ability to kind of have a tax efficient retirement and estate plan. So I guess at the end of the day, once you create a successful enterprise, uh, over your career, you want to create the ability to sell what you build. So to create equity, if you're an employee or you're a self-employed individual, there's a bit of a difficulty in kind of creating that equity piece that you can kind of sell down the road. So we're going to discuss the sole proprietorship. So there's advantages and disadvantages to this structure, type of structure. So a sole proprietorship is just an individual who operates by him, by him or herself. So the advantages are it's easy and inexpensive to register. In Nova Scotia, it's about $150 annually to register your sole proprietorship. There's little to no regulatory burden. And you have the, the key piece here from a tax perspective is you have the ability to deduct losses, early losses, so against any other source of income. All the profits go to you directly and you have the ability to make all the decisions. There are several disadvantages though to a sole proprietorship. Uh, there's unlimited liability. So in the event that there's something catastrophic happens in your sole proprietorship, you could potentially be liable for it. And in theory, uh, your, your personal assets, such as your house, your car, may be, may come, uh, you may be liable for them. Your income is taxable at personal rates. So as I mentioned, uh, given Canada's progressive tax rate system, um, if you have taxable income in an excess of $200,000, you're going to be taxed at 54 cents on the dollar. So, uh, there is a bit of a disadvantage there. There's a lack of continuity. So in the event that uh, you you become ill or unable to operate your business, there's a there's not really an ability to continue the business. There is definitely a difficulty to raising capital. So it's investors are unusual. They will never they will unlikely to invest in a sole proprietor just because there's no way that they can guarantee some sort of return. And there's definitely a lack a lack of business saleability. It's very difficult to sell a sole proprietorship. So a partnership. So a partnership is when two or more parties come together and effectively they operate like a sole proprietor, but they're in a partnership. So the advantage is again, easy and inexpensive to form, just have to register with uh, your provincial regulatory body. Um, there's the startup costs are shared. There's shared profit and losses. So in the event, if you're in a 50, 50 partnership, uh, if it's, if it's a profitable, each partner gets 50% of uh, the partnership allocation. If it's if it's making if it's losing money, uh, each partner is able to take those losses and deduct it against other sources of income. As I mentioned, uh, all allocated losses are taxed personally, which may be beneficial in the early stages if there's losses on the on the early stages. There's disadvantages though. Uh, partnership agreements should be drafted and made. Uh, typically, are lawyers required of this because if you do not have a partnership agreement, it can create kind of issues down the road. Uh, the disadvantages again, income is taxable at personal rates, so up to 54%. Uh, in a general partnership situation, there is unlimited liability, similar to the sole proprietor, so your, your personal assets may be at risk. Uh, there's possible internal conflict, so if you and your partner do not agree on a decision, uh, that can create problems. And unfortunately, you are responsible for business decisions made by your partner, so if your partner fails to deliver on a contract, you can be personally liable for that. Okay, uh, continuing on, corporations. So uh, this is what I think is kind of the, the, the premier structure of the three in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases. So the, the biggest advantage to uh, incorporating, so in incorporating, uh, you kind of create a cor corporation and then that's when you put all your business assets in your corporation and you operate your business out of a corporation. So the advantage is uh, there's limited liability. So you're only liable for the investment you make. So if you make a hundred dollar investment in your corporation, uh, you're only liable for that hundred dollars. Ownership is transferable. So if I incorporate for a hundred dollars and then down the road, I decide to sell my shares to Mike, I can sell them at a thousand dollars and transfer it. And he just owns the shares and I'm done. It's a separate legal entity. So a corporation is different from an individual, uh, so it's separately for legal purposes. It's easier to raise capital. So in, in, in the corporate world, um, if you have a corporation, uh, more investors are gonna be able to kind of provide you with capital because they can receive shares in return or debt, which is can be secured against something. There's no lower internal, there's a lower internal tax rate. As I mentioned on the active business income under, under $500,000 in Nova Scotia, the active rate is 13%. Over $500,000 taxable income corporately, uh, you're taxed at 
So that is a bit of an advantage when compared to an individual where you can pay in excess of 54% of tax. So there's, there's the ability to defer income taxes. So if you don't need all the cash your corporation is generating, you can pay 13 cents on the dollar in tax and leave it in there, which can be definitely advantageous in the future. Uh, there is disadvantages though. Uh, the regulations and the startup costs are somewhat high in comparison to sole proprietors and, uh, and partnerships. Uh, the startup cost to set up and incorporate a, a corporation might be anywhere between two and three thousand dollars at the low end. Uh, the corporate record keeping piece, uh, you need, do need to have an annual, effectively an annual general meeting with minutes and approved statements and such. There could be conflict between shareholders. So if you have a 50 50 shareholder uh, relationship, that could be potentially an issue. Typically, we see structures where there's a majority voter. Um, and then res residency requirements of shareholders. So in Canada, there's a there's a rule, effectively a tax rule, that says you're a Canadian-controlled private corporation. So in order to be a CCPC, um, you have to be controlled by Canadian individuals, and that provides you with access to that lower 13% tax rate. If you, in, in effect, sell more than 50% of your shares to a non-resident, Unfortunately, that's when you lose the CCPC status and you have to pay, start paying corporate tax at the 31%. So just uh, highlighting a typical simple structure that we see in place here at Grant Thornton. So at the top, uh, there's a family trust, which is the triangle. So a family trust uh, will have beneficiaries in which they can receive dividend income from an operating corporation. So the operating corporation at the bottom would house all the business assets and that's where the business would be run. At any point uh, where the operating corporation wants to pay dividends, they can pay it up to the family trust who can then allocate out to the beneficiaries. Unfortunately, um, we used to have a bit, a bit more flexibility. Um, now there's new rules that state that the, the beneficiaries who you see at the top must have some form of either capital invested into in the business or be actively working in the business in order to receive dividend income. So we're somewhat more limited in our ability to kind of split income now. Uh, but the main benefit of having a family trust in place is that in the event that you do sell, sell that operating corporation at the bottom is that you have the ability to split the lifetime capital gains exemption among all the beneficiaries. So the current lifetime capital gains exemption is $848,000. So that can be substantial in the long run. And on the left, you see that we typically leave the owner manager with voting control of the operating corporation, just to prevent any issues with the trustees uh, taking control of the operating corporation. So now I'm going to discuss corporate remuneration options. So dividends. So dividends, they're non-deductible by the corporation. So they're paid out after, after taxes. So they do not generate RRSP room for the individual. And now there's a new reasonableness test and or rate of return test, which we call tax on split income or TOSI, that's in effect for dividends now, effective January 1, 2018. Uh, typically, CRA is going to want you to make quarterly tax installments. Uh, but the benefit, the big benefit to dividends are that they're easier to manage. Salaries. So they're deductible by the corporation. So in effect, if your income in the corporation before payment to the owner manager is 100, you can deduct that $100 as salary paid to the owner manager and the corporation is taxed at, at, at a zero net income. So there's no corporate taxes paid. So that generates RSP room for the individual, but there are payroll taxes that could apply, such as EI, CPP, and WCV. There is a reasonableness test associated with a salary, so in effect, you can't pay somebody in the mailroom $150,000 a year uh, in salary uh, for working 15 hours a week. Uh, one of the big pain points is a source deduction remittance requirements. So depending on the size of your payroll, uh, you may be required to kind of remit either quarterly or monthly to the CRA. And the penalties on not remitting on time can be substantial. So that's when we typically take a look at the business and say, do you really want to uh, pay out a salary and have this kind of source deduction requirements uh, versus paying just out dividends where you just have to manage your quarterly tax installments and we issue the T5 income slip.
So business saleability. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a thing called lifetime capital gains exemption. In 2018, that's at $848,000 and $252. So in order to hit that or make that lifetime capital gains exemption, it must be a sale of qualified small business corporation shares. So back to thinking about our operating company, in order for that operating, operating company to qualify as a QSBC, it has to pass three tests. So the first test is substantially all, which CRA has deemed greater than 90% of the fair market value of the assets in the corporation are used in an active business in Canada. So in that test, that test actually has to apply on data disposition. So the day you sell the shares, 90% or greater of the fair market value of assets in the corporation are used in an active business in Canada. So for example, if your corporation has $100 in total assets and 90 of it are cash, which would be considered excess and not used in operations, you're not gonna make that test. But if $95 out of the $100 is active assets, you're okay. Throughout the 24 months, immediately before the share was disposed of, the share must not have been owned by anyone other than the individual or the person related to the individual. So this test just basically says that no one can own the shares for 24 months, like, when, unless you're related or you, it's yourself. This just kind of prevents individuals from buying up companies and reselling them within a quick, quick period to gain access to the lifetime capital gains exemption. Throughout the 24 months, immediately before the share was disposed of, greater than 50% of the fair market value of the assets in the corporation were used in an active business in Canada. So similar to test number one, test number three makes, makes you ensure that you have greater than 50% of your assets uh, used in an active p business in Canada. So this test is definitely less stringent than test number one, but it's definitely something to be made aware of. So in the event that you're kind of looking two years down the road and you say that there may be a potential sale, just keep an eye on that 50% mark just to make sure that you can kind of argue that greater than 50% of your assets were used in an active business in Canada. So continuing on with business saleability, um, allowable business investment losses, or what we call ABLES, and cumulative net investment losses, or CNILs, they reduce your lifetime capital gains exemption. So in the event that you have an ABLE or a CNIL, that just effectively just reduces that $848,000. So as I mentioned earlier, great care has to be taken to manage active assets prior to a sale. So we refer to this, this in the accounting world as purification. So if you're not close to that 90% test, but you're above the 50%, we can do uh, creative things in the tax world to kind of make sure you get it greater than that 90%. And generally, the selling corporation must be a Canadian-controlled private corporation. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the corporation must be Canadian-controlled. So greater than 51% of the votes in value must be held by a Canadian resident individual. And then... One big benefit is you have the ability to multiply the lifetime capital gains exemption in a family trust. So that orange triangle with all the beneficiaries, if you sell your operating company, you can multiply up that $848,000 by uh, as many beneficiaries as there are in the trust. So, But there is one big caveat associated with that is that the beneficiaries will be entitled to the capital gain. So that's something to consider and discuss with your accountant in the event that occurs. But another good planning point is if your business is successful and is generating excess cash, at that point, then you might want to consider a holding company just for creditor protection issues and to make sure that you can kind of stay on side with the qualified small business corporation tests. All right, I'm going to pass it on to Sean, <clears throat> unless there's any questions. I'm not, anybody, <clears throat> sorry, anybody have any questions? I don't see any on the, on the chat, so I think we're okay. Great. All right, thanks, Pat. So uh, I guess as I noted earlier, I, uh, I work in our advisory group here at uh, GT, and we specialize in valuation, M&A, uh, due diligence, and financial modeling with the focus of today's discussion on financial projections and business planning. So I guess in the absence of having historical financial results, uh, your financial projections are really a snapshot into your company, uh, where it's going and how long you plan to take to get there. So it's important to understand that 
projections are never perfect. They never will be perfect. And actual results will always vary from your forecasts and your projected information. But it's really important to understand the financial plan for your business, how far along you currently are in that financial plan, uh, the milestones that you've set for yourself and what is required to meet those milestones and how your company is eventually going to fund itself and create a return on investment for both yourselves and potential investors that are investing in your companies. Uh, just from a financial projections overview, so typically what we do and what we see is uh, projections comprised of three key statements. So one being the income statement, two being the balance sheet, and three being the cash flow statement. And another important thing to include in your projections is an input summary showing some of the key assumptions that you've included as part of pulling together your projections. So just to kind of go through some standard versions of uh, the three key statements that we see. So the first one being the income statement, which generally represents revenue in and expenses out. Uh, cash flow items are addressed separately in the, in the cash flow statement, and this really just represents your income and expenses. Next is the balance sheet. So the balance sheet really highlights working capital with a specific attention on cash or whether or not you require bank financing or an operating line, uh, other working capital such as accounts receivable, any inventory that you might have, uh, payables and accruals, and then any income tax liability. Uh, it also highlights any financing that you would have received through uh, long-term debt or equity injections that you would have put in yourself through shareholder loans and then any other financing that you would have received through uh, your own personal funds or uh, potential equity investors. And then the third, the third financial statement is a cash flow statement, which is essentially a fallout between the income statement and the balance sheet. So the income statement shows how much earnings you're expecting to generate, but the cash flow statement paints the truest picture of the cash flow of the operations. And it really divides it into three separate categories. So it shows how much cash you're generating from your operating results, how much of that cash is either being injected or paid out through financing, and where you're investing is happening. So if you're investing in your product or you're investing in capital equipment, that shows up in the investing category. So some of the best practices for developing financial projections, if you have them, it's, it's important to include historical results. I think that they, they lend a lot to your projections because you can use them as a benchmark and investors can use them as a benchmark of where you are today versus where you see yourself going in the next three to five years. Uh, in terms of a timeline, I would say that projections are usually done between three and no more than five years. Once you get beyond five years, it's, it's basically like throwing a dart at a dartboard. It's very, it's very difficult to determine where you're going to be at. Uh, level of detail, whether you want to go weekly, monthly, or annually, I think it, I think it depends on the situation. So if you're looking at preparing cash flow budgeting, then I think weekly would be would be a good idea because you're going to want that level of detail to know what your weekly cash obligations are. But then in terms of projections and financial forecasts, I think a combination of monthly and annually is, is good enough. So for the first year or two, maybe you want to know on a month to month basis where your company is going, but beyond year two, I think annually is, is perfectly fine. It's, it's a similar situation as, going beyond five years in your projections, it's, it's so far out that it's, it's very difficult to determine at that level of detail where your company is going to be. Uh, you want to make sure that the numbers that you're putting in your projections are, are not overly optimistic, but they do represent realistic and achievable targets. You want to set targets that you're going to be able to meet because any investor or financing institution, once you provide a set of projections to them, 
they could hold you accountable to those when they look at your business in a year's time they'll say okay why why are you so far off your projection so if you're overly optimistic or um even the other side overly pessimistic they're going to want to know why why there's such a difference there so i guess in that same vein it's it's really important to spend the time up front stress testing all the assumptions that you're putting in there and making sure that the projections you're putting forth is a true representation of kind of where you see your company going. So uh, in terms of projections in business planning, uh, it's important to build your projections off of key inputs or uh, assumptions. So you can allow for flexibility within your financial model. So avoid hard coded numbers. I've seen a lot of projections and forecasts come across my desk where the top line or revenue is projected over the next five years and those numbers are all hard coded. I would rather see an input generated that you can build your revenue off. So in year one, you want to see 5% growth. Year two, you want to see 20% growth. And by changing that input, you automatically change, change that top line figure. Uh, it's also important to allow for sensitivity. So any logical investor and just for planning purposes, it's important to understand what happens if you kind of knock the socks off your projections or what happens if the bottom falls out. And then the most realistic set of projections is probably somewhere in the middle of those two. And it's also important to build key areas off one another. So if you're expecting funding of approximately $10,000, how does your growth rate change based on receiving $500,000? So obviously there's gonna be a difference between the level of growth you anticipate versus the amount of funding that you guys receive. Uh, and then I guess just from a, a non-financial point of view, it's, it's really important to include assumptions slash metrics that show the targets that you're benchmarking yourself against. So I guess some of those key metrics would be growth rate, funding milestones, anticipated customer base, and then some of the non-financial performance measures would be customer satisfaction, number of retailers onboarded, or any other ones that, that you guys would see in your, in your individual companies. Uh, so I guess just some some key takeaways from from the advisory point of view Your projections are never going to be perfect. It's it is important to focus on On spending the time up front and making sure that you're comfortable with them. You want to make sure that they're achievable You want to make sure that you've set yourself you haven't set yourself up to fail You want to make sure that they're the most realistic possible result that you can that you can achieve it's important to allow for sen sensitivity. Uh, again, spend the time up front building them. If you can, if you can spend the time up front and create a management tool rather than just a set of projections, I think that's really, really important in terms of planning out your company from a financial point of view. And then the reason that you're doing projections and forecasts is so you can benchmark yourself against your actual results. So it's it's important to, to reflect on where you said you were going to be six months ago versus where you are. So it's, it's important to take a look at kind of the goals you set for yourself and how you're tracking against those goals. And it's also important to constantly update your projections and your forecast based on new realities in your business. So six months down the road, you're going to have a much better picture of where you guys see yourselves. So it's important to constantly reflect those new realities in, in your business plan and in your forecasts. And then I think, I think that's all from uh, Mike, Pat and I, uh, I can open up the floor to any questions on my section. And then also if any questions have kind of percolated from a tax or assurance point of view, we're happy to address those too. Well, I do have one question um, that is, how easy is it to start as a proprietor and incorporate in two to three years? What are the pros and cons? I will defer that one to Patrick. <laughs> so the question is, how easy is it to start as a proprietor? 
and wait two or three years and then incorporate. Yes, and what are the pros and cons of that? All right, so assuming if you're early expecting within the first two to three years for there to be like losses, um, sometimes that can be advisable uh, depending on if there's potential liability. So it depends on what type of business it is. If the business it, it doesn't really generate a lot of potential liabilities, we can recommend that. So what typically would happen in the event you do that is come year three when you're ready to incorporate, uh, there's kind of a, a tax law or tax rule, which we call a, a section 85 rollover. And you're able to roll over your personal business assets when you're operating as a sole proprietor into a corporation on a tax deferred basis. So for example, Mike's business, he's been operating it for two or three years. At the time, it, at year three, his business is worth a thousand dollars. So that's what a third party would pay to buy Mike's business. So Mike decides to roll it into a corporation. So Mike's cost of that business is just a laptop. So his laptop is really only worth a hundred dollars. So when he rolls his business assets in, he can take back that a hundred dollar. He can roll that thousand dollars in. And then $100 would be a promissory note from the corporation to him personally. So that could be paid tax-free to him at any time. And that other $900, which we typically would put into preferred shares, uh, which can be redeemable by Mike at any time. But in order for Mike to take out that $900, he has to pay dividend tax rates on those. So about 41%. So the pros and cons um, to doing, to kind of waiting to incorporate are, you, you may be uncertain as to how your business is going to function and operate for the first two to three years. Uh, so it may be advisable just to kind of operate as a proprietor and see if it's going to be successful or not. Um, kind of the cons of doing that are definitely the personal liability piece. And if in the event that someone really wants to buy your business and your idea, it's easier to sell when it's an incorporation. Um, the cost piece uh, to incorporating is kind of marginal. I mean, if you, if it's just a simple incorporation, the legal and accounting fees would probably be between two and three thousand uh, dollars. So the cost component really shouldn't be a driver. It should more so be kind of your your kind of your profitability forecast and kind of your liability piece. Um, either 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 option is just depends on the facts and the circumstances. Okay, um, <clears throat> I think that's uh, seen as a su su uh, sufficient answer. Have we got any other questions? I, I don't see any in the chat. Um, I, have, I have a question um, in terms of uh, projections. I'm just wondering, you know, how can people make good projections? It's one of the things that we see here at, at uh, Natural Products Canada when we look at people's sales projections, that's one of those things that we're always sort of questioning is, is where are these projections coming from and how uh, validated are they? How, how much homework have they done? I just wondered if you could kind of talk about how people can go about getting really good projections. Yeah, so I think it all goes back to kind of spending the time up front and, and really understanding what those inputs are into your projections. So Typically, when they come across my desk, it's an income statement with uh, revenue, expenses, and then a bottom line. And the revenue obviously follows that kind of hockey stick growth. And when you ask, where is this growth coming from? And they don't have the answer, then that, that just shows you kind of how important it is to really understand, okay, we're, we're expecting 10% growth in year one, 15% growth in year two, 50% growth in year three, and these are all the reasons why. So if you follow kind of a build-up approach rather than just kind of working backwards into numbers, it makes it so you can, you can support those, those growth rates a lot easier. And, that's, and it's also, that's why it's important to include some of those kind of non-monetary items. So your anticipated levels of growth rate your number of retailers that you've onboarded. Uh, and even if you want to get into the specifics of these are the number of customers that we anticipate in your one, two, and three, and this is why. So it's, it's important to kind of take it that step further rather than just showing top line expenses and bottom line and really 
dive into the assumptions that you're kind of putting into those numbers. Okay. Yeah, sometimes we, we've uh, heard the horror stories of, you know, people saying, well, the global market for this is X. <laughs> and so we'll just take, you know, 5% yeah. of that. And, you know, there, there's really no. Well, yeah, ex exactly. That. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's why it's important to kind of look at it from a build up perspective rather than looking at it from kind of that global perspective. Well, it's a, it's a $10 billion market. And we, if we even take half a percent of that, then we're going to be, we're going to be, we're going to be great. So. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions from the other uh, participants. Is there any other um, sort of uh, closing remarks that you would like to uh, add before we finish things up? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I just want to thank, thank you for organizing this and, uh, thank all the participants for, uh, for taking part in the webinar. And I mean, if there are any questions that, that kind of come up afterwards, you guys have, you guys have our contact information. Feel free to send Patrick, Mike or I an email. Uh, we're happy to, happy to take a look at any questions that you guys might have, or feel free to give us a call too. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's really been great information. It's a lot to think about for companies that are just starting out and it's good to have your perspective on those, those uh, items. Uh, for everybody in the audience, we'll send a note when the recording of this episode is available in case you want to watch it again or share it with someone else. And then finally, uh, I'll just provide a reminder of the next webinar in this series coming up October 16th uh, called uh, or focusing on funding and financing and government incentives, uh, which I'm sure will have lots of valuable information. So I hope everyone can join us. For now, uh, have a good day and thanks very much for being here. Thanks so much.